This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. We're going to study of Newton's equations. Um, tonight is Hamilton's night. Part of the point, in fact, maybe the main point of the Hamiltonian formulation of mechanics goes back to something that I talked about at the very first lecture. We talked about the basic structure of classical thinking classical mechanics, but not classical mechanics quite, but something even a little more primitive. We talked about discrete systems, the coin, which could either be heads, no, this way it's heads, heads or tails. And that's a two-state system, two simple states. And then we talked about possible laws of evolution. One simple law of evolution is nothing happens. Evolution now might mean a sequence of states uh, separated by a small time interval, a discrete time interval, a tenth of a second or whatever. We update every tenth of a second. Then we spoke about a simple law of nature, or, which was a simple law of uh, coin flipping or coin changing, which would be no change at all. It's here, it's here, it's here without doing anything. That's a simple law of uh, of um, evolution. Another less simple law of evolution is if it's heads, then the next time it's tails. If it's tails, the next time it's heads. Tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads. Both of these rules have the feature that if you know the state of the system at any instant of time, you know it at the next instant of time, in other words, the updating rule is precise. But also, the backdating rule is also precise. If you know where you are at any instant, you know where you were. We even talked about the general structure of such simple theories. Instead of just two states, we could imagine a system with many states, each one being represented by a point in a space, we might as well now call that space phase space. It's the phase space of a simple discrete system. In this case, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six. If I stop there with only six states, then we could be talking about a die. A die is in dice. Six possible configurations. Uh, add two more. I don't know. We could be talking, what, what system has eight states? Three coins. <laughs> Three coins. Um, precisely. So, this is a general kind of situation. And the basic setup, in fact, the definition of a phase space is if you know where you are in the phase space, you know where you'll be next, and you know where you came from. So as a rule, which could be represented simply by a set of arrows, which tells you where to go next. Oh, uh, nope, you can't come back because you've already been there. Here, 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 and then back to here. For example, you can have other kinds of laws, not different in, uh, in kind, but different in detail. For example, you could have some closed loops like this. So, wherever you are, you go to the next place. But now there's some closed sort of cycles uh, so that if you're on this cycle, you will stay there. And if you're on this cycle, you will stay there. This corresponds to the existence of a conservation law. We can imagine that this, these three states over here are labeled as having property equal to plus one, and over here, 
property, the same property is minus 1. Well, if you've got plus 1, you stay plus 1. Plus 1 never becomes minus 1, and minus 1 never becomes plus 1 because all of the configurations with number minus 1 go to configurations with number minus 1, and so forth. But both of these kinds of laws have the property that if you know where you are, you know where you'll be, and you know where you were. That's to be contrasted with a law which might look something like this. If you're over here, you go to here. If you're over here, you go to here. And if you're over here, you go to here. That's a very definite updating rule. Wherever you are, you know where to go next. But there's something funny about it, namely, in particular, you can't go backward in, the unique, in, in a unique way. You can go backward from this point. From this point, you know that you must have come from here. But if you're over here, you don't know whether you came from here or whether you came from here. What's going on here is points are running into each other. There's yet another way to think of it. Imagine the phase space being populated, populated with uh, points, and the point, in fact, let's imagine the entire phase space is populated with red dots. And the red dots all move. They do a dance. The dance is simply to follow the trajectories uh, as they're prescribed by the law, whatever the law is. So this red dot goes to here, this red dot goes to here, this red dot goes to here, this red dot goes to here. Notice every red dot knows where to go, knows where to come from. And there's a kind of um, rigidity to the, red dot, to the red dots. None disappear, none spontaneously appear, none disappear, none appear, they simply just rigidly, or um, what's an even better word than rigidly, uh, a fluid, an incompressible, <coughs> kind of incompressible motion where points don't run into each other. Same thing here. Same thing here if we populate the points with red dots and we allow them to move along the arrows instant by instant by instant, each instant the number of red dots is the same, they don't run into each other, they don't bifurcate, the whole thing just moves in an incompressible way. On the other hand, with this law, we could start a red point at each place, but then after one motion, this one would have disappeared, never to reappear, and we would have only two places which were occupied, going back and forth, back and forth. There would be some loss, in a sense, <coughs> of points in the phase space. Phase space points would not be conserved. The whole point of Hamilton's mechanics, Hamilton's form of mechanics, is number one, it's a form in which every point knows where to go next and knows where it came from without points ever being lost or gained. In other words, a kind of rigid motion in a phase space or an incompressible motion of the points in phase space, uh, which may also be called information conservation. We'll see, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit further in the future. Okay, another point of Hamilton's equations, let's, let's think about ordinary F equals MA type equations. They're not of this form. Why not? Well, let's suppose you know where you are. Let's make a plot. Here's the positions of a particle, possible positions of a particle. Here's the particle x, y, and z. <coughs> Supposing I know the particle is over here, do I know where it will be next? No. I need to know something else. I need to know not only where it is now, 
but I need to know where it was an instant back. In other words, I need to know the position and the velocity. Knowing the position and the velocity is the same thing as knowing the position and an instant and knowing the position a slight bit earlier. So I need two pieces of information. I need to know where the object is. And I also need a kind of ghost piece of information, which is where it was an instant ago. And that's enough to tell me where it will be next. Next means after a short prescribed period of time. So specifying the locations of a system, by now we can simply call them the cues of a system, does not constitute a phase space. The phase space constitutes everything you need to know in order to tell where you'll be next, but in such a way that there's a rigidity to the motion. A rigidity to the motion points never gained nor lost. That's what phase space is. Phase space is a way of representing the configurations of a mechanical system uh, so that the motions are described much as I've described these discrete, discrete motions. We'll come back to it in detail. Can I ask a question here before yeah. we move on? Yeah. And um, I wonder if you can talk about what some of the insights or pressures or motivations were for this reformulation of Newtonian mechanics. Uh, well, were um, problems? yeah, I think the Lagrangian formulation was formulated by people for practical reasons. The practical reasons being most systems were awfully complicated and difficult to apply at people's MA. And so a more general, a more general formulation, which was not dependent on particular sets of coordinates, in many, many contexts, rectilinear coordinates are simply not appropriate to a problem. Components of vectors are not appropriate to a problem or not particularly useful. Uh, motion, for example, Motion of a particle on the flat blackboard can be nicely described by x's and y's, and we can use x and y components and write f equals ma. Motion on the surface of a sphere, an object moving around on the surface of a sphere, it's not natural in any special sense to introduce rectangular coordinates. You can't introduce rectangular coordinates onto the sphere. You can introduce coordinates latitude and longitude, but you can introduce rectangular coordinates. And the naive idea of um, components, the naive idea of components, rectangular Cartesian coordinates is not useful. So it's, more, it's useful to define mechanics in a way that doesn't depend on any specific co set of coordinates. That was, the, that was Lagrange's motive, motivation. What Hamilton was smoking, I don't know. <laughs> but what he developed was an extremely beautiful, elegant formulation of mechanics, which turned out, which I, I don't think he ever really used for anything. He simply admired it. And uh, physicists admired it afterwards. It turned out to be very useful. Part of the usefulness of it was because it does conserve information in the same sense that I've described over here. I'm sure he was aware of that, but I don't know if it was foremost in his mind. But ultimately, the real power of it came when quantum mechanics was developed. So um, it's hard for me to put myself in Hamilton's position. I mean, it was one of these brilliant mathematical insights that kind of came from nowhere. Just uh, uh, somehow he saw the structures there in ways that I think most of us would not have. And so, no, I can't really give you his intuitions. What we can do is do it. And after we've done it, go out back and talk about why it's so useful and why it's, uh, mm -hmm. why it's uh, so, of such power. I'm not particularly sure that anybody realized how powerful and useful it was. Um, until quantum mechanics was developed. I think that really was the time when people first really began 
feeling they had to learn what Hamilton had, uh, had to say. Of course, he was long dead by that time. All right, another way, another observation about it is it takes a certain number of second-order differential equations. F equals ma is a second-order differential equation for each component. Second order means that it involves second derivatives. Not first derivatives, but second derivatives. So it may also involve a first derivative here and there, but it contains second derivatives. It contains accelerations. Second derivatives with respect to time or something. How many equations are there? Well, if there are a certain number of particles in a certain number of dimensions, that tells you how many equations there are. One particle, there are three equations. Two particles, there are six equations, and so forth, each one being a second-order differential equation. What, ha what, what Hamilton's equations, or in general, you can always take a system of second-order differential equations, let's say n of them, and replace them by twice as many first-order equations that only contain first derivatives. It's very easy. It's so easy it's almost stupid. So let's, uh, let's discuss how you take n second-order equations. The method is completely general, but I'll just illustrate it for, uh, for Newton's equations. Supposing we have a certain number of equations of the form derivative, second derivative of some ith component of x by dt squared is equal to the ith component of force divided by the mass. I've written acceleration is equal to f over m. I don't know why exactly. I just wanted to write the acceleration on the left-hand side. Let's suppose now that there are n such differential equations. Let's take that and make two n equations, each of which only contains a first time derivative. To do that, first of all, define, now we can do it many ways, but I'm going to do it in a particular way that uh, that will be, uh, that, that in order to get familiar with uh, terminology. First of all, let's, re let's define the xi by dt. And, it, and let's uh, throw in a factor of the mass, <coughs> the mass of the i uh, uh, That's one mass. Everybody has the same mass. Let's take m times the x sub i dt and give it a name. What do we call it? We call it p sub i. Now, let's write, I don't know why I put m on the left hand on the right hand side of the equation. Why did I do that? Let's put it back where it belongs. F equals ma. Now let's write f equals ma in the form. Mi. Hmm? Mi. Ah, let's just make one m. All right. Now let's take. Uh, this is of course a first order equation. It only contains first time derivatives. But now let's write f equals ma in the form dp by dt is equal to f i i. Both of these equations are only first-order equations, but there are twice as many of them. There are twice as many equations, but each one only containing first-time derivatives. They become a 2n, a system of 2n differential equations for twice as many variables. And now, what are the, what are the twice as many variables? x sub i and p sub i. First order equations are the kind which tell you where to go if you know where you are without knowing where you were. A first order equation tells you how to update to the next position if you know where you are. But knowing where you are now means knowing where you are in the phase space. It's equivalent to the old view. You again need to know two things, a position and something equivalent to a velocity. But it's just a different uh, mindset. Thinking about the phase space <coughs> gives you a picture, x and p, in which wherever you are, you know where to go next. 
So there's no new physics in it, no new laws of nature, just a different mindset, thinking about the state of a system <coughs> not as a configuration, but as a combination of a position and a momentum. Or, not just one position and momentum, but a position and a momentum for each degree of freedom, for each coordinate. More generally, of course, we would talk about Q's and P's, or Q's and Pi's. I think I'm going to give up the notation Pi. I got the, the, we'll just call canonical momentum P's to be done with it. <coughs> but those are the various um, motivations, various properties of the Hamiltonian description. It's the equation of it's the Hamiltonian description of mechanics is the equations for how things move around on the phase space. Knowing where you are, they tell you where you move next. In fact, you could almost think of it just as, did I erase what I have to Yeah, I did erase what I have had, but let's put it back. We thought of a law as being a kind of flow, a flow of the points in phase space. We're going to see that there's a natural sense in which mechanics constitutes a flow in the phase space. Wherever you are, you know where to go next. And if you were to imagine a populating the phase space, populating the phase space would mean taking a lot of identical systems and starting each one at a different point in the phase space and watching them as they evolve. That would define a flow in the phase space. And it's that flow in the phase space that Hamiltonian mechanics is all about. It's almost as if the points in phase space were kind of fluid, and we're studying how that fluid moves. If we're interested in any specific system, then we think of it as a little particle moving along with the flow. We start at some place, we allow it to move along with the flow, and uh, follow its coordinates and its momentum. All right, now we need a small piece of mathematics. It's an easy piece of mathematics, but it's a rather formal piece. It's, it's the mathematics that's called the Legendre transformation. We're going to do it first in the simplest possible case. Suppose there are two variables. Let me call them V and P. Just secretly, between you and me, V stands for velocity and P stands for momentum. But now forget I told you that because we're going to think about the uh, Legendre transformation as a mathematical trick in many, many different contexts. All right, so I have, there are two variables. Suppose, whoops, that's a funny P, isn't it? V and P. But they're not independent variables. In fact, there's really only one variable. They're functions of each other. They're functions of each other, and for simplicity, not for simplicity, this is important. Let's suppose they're single valued functions of each other. Single valued function means that if you know P, you know V, and if you know V, you know P. No ambiguity. That means the graph of P versus V looks something like that. What it can't do is it's not allowed to do that. Why not? Because if it did this, there would be certain values of P where you would have an ambiguity about what V is. It's also not allowed to do this, because then there would be certain values of V where you wouldn't know what P was. Single valued means that the graph of the function p versus v looks like this. Any point on it, or for any value of v, there's a unique p, and for any value of p, there's a unique v. Actually, just for simplicity, although this, this is not important, let's just draw the graph so that it goes to the origin. Then if we have such a single-valued function, 
not just a single value function, but a one-to-one -one function, meaning it's single valued whether you think about it as p as a function of v or v as a function of p, then it's possible to invent a pair of functions, one which I'll call L, secretly the Lagrangian. <coughs> And the Lagrangian is a function of v. And it has the property that the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to v defines p. Why would I bother inventing a function l whose derivative with respect to v is p? Well, we'll come to y. But I can always do it. Uh, this is just ordinary derivative for the moment. Since there's only one variable v, we don't have to make it a partial derivative. d l by dv. We're going to find that given l, we can construct a symmetrically related function that we're going to call h. h is to be regarded as a function of p. When we think about l, we will think about v as the independent variable. When we think about h, we will think about p as the independent variable. Of course, l is also a function of p because v is a function of p. Of course, h is also a function of v because p is a function of v. So, uh, but each one is thought of as a function of its own variable, L of V or H of P. And the relationship is H and L are connected by the derivative of H with respect to P is V. This is a completely symmetrical relation between P and V and between L and H. The derivative with respect to v of L is p. The derivative of p of h is v. Now, let me show you why that's always possible to do and to show you the relationship between L and h. OK, let's, let's take our function, which the simplicity I just had passed through the origin, but you can work it out whether it passes through the origin or not. Notice the derivative of L with respect to V is equal to P. Think of that as P as a function of V, of course. V is the independent variable in the top equation. So P is really a function of V, as it is over here, P of V. Remember, the P is a function of V. I just restarted over here. P of V. We can also think of V as a function of P. And now, Let's solve this equation for L by just writing that L is equal to the integral of P of V dV. Does everybody recognize that? If the derivative of L is P, then L is the integral of P. We can write this as d. Well, does everybody recognize what I've done here? Is that a definite indefinite return? Okay, that can be taken to be a definite integral, and for definiteness, let's take it to be the integral from zero. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where we take the integral from, but let's for definiteness take it from zero, from v equals zero. If we differentiate an integral, we just get the integrand. So if we differentiate L with respect to, let's put V up here, definite integral from 0 to V, V of V dV. If you differentiate an integral with respect to the end point of integration, you just get the integrand. So that's this relationship here. Derivative of L is equal to P. We can always do this. Here, that's L of the end point, if you like. All right, we can now draw a picture of what L means. 
at least on this graph. L is the area, L of V, or let's say L of V is constructed in the following way. You go to your point V, you draw <coughs> that line, and then you consider all the area underneath the curve here. This is not a triangle, it's a curve. That's the integral of P of V dV, and it's the it's L at point V. L of V. It has the property that if you differentiate it with respect to V, you get P. Now, what about H? Well, we can do the same thing with H. H must be the integral of V dT, just by symmetry. The, uh, the other equation is that h of p is the integral, we can again start at 0 and go to p, of v of p dp. Notice that if we differentiate h with respect to p, we just get v. That's the other defining equation here. The derivative of h with respect to p is equal to v. All right, so the geometry of that, then, is that h, the area in here is h, h of p, and the area in here is L of v. This, is, this area in here is the integral of v of, p, of, v of p dp. Does that need further explanation? Well, now we know the relationship between H and L. Take, the air, take H and add it to L. H plus L is the area of this whole rectangle. <coughs> What's the area of the rectangle? It's P times V. <coughs> this is usually written as H is equal to PV minus L. So it's clearly the same thing. For some reason, we tend to write, we tend to think of L first and then try to figure out what H is. All right, so now let's write our system of equations that are called a Legendre transformation. You start with an L of V. You differentiate L of V. Ordinary derivative will do here. Derivative of L with respect to V defines P and gives you P as a function of V. Then you construct H by multiplying P times V and subtracting L. Now, L, of course, is a function of V, but wherever you see V, substitute its value in terms of P. So we can think of this as L, same script around here, L of V, but V is a function of P. So, and V is also a function of P here. So H gets to be thought of as a function of P. L is a function of V. And when we do this, we'll now prove, I'll now prove, although it's, it's clear from the geometry here, that the derivative of H with respect to P is V. Let's do a little manipulation algebraically. Here's what we do. We consider a small change of P and ask how much H changes. How much does H change when we change P? Let's work it out. The change in H, let's just call it delta H, small change in H, is first of all, what's the change in a product? If we change, a, if we make a small change in the values of some variables, what's the change in a product? 
sum of two terms, one term being the first factor times the change in the second, and vice versa. All right, so first of all, we get the term which is P times the small change in V. The second term is V plus the small change in P. And finally, minus the derivative of a Lagrangian, the derivative of L with respect to V. Remember that L depends only on V times the change in V. Well, wait a minute. I defined the L by dv to be called P. That was the way that I constructed P from L. The L by dv is equal to P. So look right here. We have the L by dv. I'm sorry I sometimes write partial derivatives and sometimes total. It doesn't matter. When there's only one variable. Partial and total are the same. All right, so this thing is P. Well, here I have PDV. Here I have minus PDV. So these two cancel completely. These two are the same, and they will cancel. Well, not the same, but not the same. And that just leaves the change in H is V times the change in P. That's the same thing as saying that the h by dp is equal to v. The h by dp is equal to v. In other words, the change in h, when I change p a little bit, is just equal to v. OK, that is the Legendre transformation. So L, define the LDV to be p. Then construct H, which is PV minus L. And now you have a reciprocal relationship where the H by dP is equal to V. So if we interchange L and we interchange L and H, and we also interchange P and V, it's completely symmetric. They're completely symmetrically related to each other. This little demonstration over here is nothing but uh, the geometry of that rectangle being divided <coughs> in H and L. That's a mathematical construction, which is not only, which is at the heart of many, many things, <coughs> particular mechanics, but also thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is just filled with Legendre transformations all over the place, and variables <coughs> are related in pairs, uh, genre pairs. Now, what happens if there are many Vs? Instead of just one V, supposing there are many of them, <coughs> then the definitions go as follows. The derivative of L with respect to the I V is the I P. Now, just keep it, you should prob probably remember what V is. V is some velocity. And in Hamiltonian, I'm sorry, Lagrangian mechanics, keep in mind that the derivative of a Lagrangian with respect to a velocity is a momentum. This is just all right. Let's let's uh, let's apply this to Lagrangian mechanics in a few minutes. But this is not a new relationship for us. Now, of course, we should use partial derivatives because I'm imagining many variables. Partial of L with respect to these problems. That's P sub I, definition at this point. Okay. Now we construct H of P, not of a single momentum, but of a collection of P's. H of P means H of all of the P's. And this becomes summation over all of the I's, P sub I, V sub I, minus L. This may start to look familiar to you. Let's go through the same little derivation here. Now, the change in H is a sum of terms of P sub I, V sub I. I'm not going to write summation signs. 
whenever I write a piece of I and a piece of I like that and so forth, think sum over the I's. All right, so first of all, a piece of I dealt a piece of I, a piece of I dealt a piece of I, and then a derivative of L with respect to piece of I times delta V sub I. When I change things a little bit, this is what happens to H. Again, exactly the same pattern. The L by DV sub I is the same as P sub I. So they cancel. The things inside rate cancel. And all I'm left with is that the change in H is equal to the I v variable times the change in the i p variable. From this you could easily read off that the derivative of h, the partial derivative of h, with respect to p sub i is equal to v sub i. In other words, the change in h, if you only change one of the p's, say the third p. The change in h, if you change p sub 3 a little bit, is just v sub 3, keeping all the other p's fixed. So the derivative of h with respect to p sub i is just v sub i. Okay, so again, same kind of reciprocity. The L by dv sub i is p sub i. The h by dp sub i is v sub i. Completely symmetrically related to each other. Now, at the moment, these are just abstract variables. Sometimes I've called one of them a momentum. Sometimes I've called one of them a velocity. Uh, but they could be just abstract variables. And as I said, there are many applications of the change of variables from a v-type variable to a p-type variable that's kept track of by what I usually call generating functions, L and H. All right, but our interest is in mechanics. In mechanics, the Lagrangian is not only a function of velocities. It's also a function of positions. We haven't talked about positions at all. We have velocities here, <coughs> things I call V, and we have things I call P. The relationship between P's and V's and Lagrangians and Hamiltonians is exactly what I've written, but with the coordinates Q just going along for the ride, just going along as if they, as if you didn't care about them, as if they were just passive. So let me show you how the relationship between Hamiltonians and Lagrangians is nothing but a Legendre transformation of exactly this type with the extra added ingredient that there's some more variables that go along for the ride. All right, now we're doing mechanics. We have a Lagrangian. The Lagrangian is a function of what? It's a function of the Q dots. But well, let's call the Q dots V's. Velocity, generalized velocity, V sub i. Q sub i dot is by definition V sub i. So then the Lagrangian is a function of the V's and the Q's. Don't confuse Q's with P's. V sub i is equal to Q dot. Let me write up here another equation of mechanics that you're familiar with, P sub i is the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to q dot. Remember that? The L by the q dot defines p. But that's the same as saying the L by dv. Aha. Uh -huh. The L by dv equals p sub i. That's first of our equations over here. So we start to see uh, the Legendre transformation between p's and velocities beginning to shape up. And it's simply the, de it's simply the definition of canonical momentum as the derivative of Lagrangian with respect to q dot. 
Next, let's define the Hamiltonian. I'm absolutely repeating myself now, but I'm repeating myself in the language of mechanics. Let's define the Hamiltonian H to be the sum of P sub i, P sub i what? P sub i, V sub i. Usually we write P sub i, Q sub i dot, right? That's the language that we've done previously. But Q sub i dot is nothing but V sub i. So let's put V sub i. Minus Lagrangian. That's precisely the same definition that we had for the Hamiltonian, I think, in the last two lectures. So you see, we see the pattern shaping up. But now let's calculate the small change in H when we change things. What things? We're going to change the P's and the Q's. What happens if we make small changes in P's and Q's? How does the Hamiltonian change? Let's calculate that. You're taking the velocity to be a function of P and Q. It is a function of Q. Which you didn't want to transformation. In generally, that's right. In general, you can think of Q as just going along as a, for a ride as a set of parameters. Okay. Right. So the exactly. velocity depends on but, the, yeah, the that's right. P. The whole thing, yeah, that's right. So that's correct. Now, okay, what was said was, uh, was correct. And let me rephrase, let me not rephrase it, but let me just restate it. Now, the relationship between the P's and the V's is such that P is a function not just of V, but also the Q's. And V is a function of the P's and the Q's. But you can simply think of the Q's as being parameters at this point, uh, which, uh, as I said, go along for the ride for the moment. The point is, of course, when you calculate the L by dv sub i, in general, it might contain some Q dependence and not just V dependence. But that's OK. Just, uh, just pursue it. OK, let's calculate the change in H when you change things a little bit. Change things means change everything a little bit, P's and Q's. All right, the change in H. The same thing as before. Is first of all, the sum, which I won't write the summation sign, P sub i delta V sub i plus V sub i delta P sub i. So now I have minus the derivative of the Lagrangian. We have two things that the derivative of the Lagrangian depends on. Let's see which way I wrote. The L by the Q sub i delta Q sub i and minus the L by the V sub i, delta V sub i. Lagrangians depend on Q's and V's. And now we're varying everything in sight, P's and Q's. You don't have to separately vary the velocities, because you know the velocities if you know the P's and Q's. So there we are. That's the formula for changing h a little bit. It has several terms, p sub i delta v sub i, v sub i delta p sub i, derivative of Lagrangian with respect to q, times the change in q, derivative of Lagrangian with respect to v delta v. OK, it's a little bit complicated, but fortunately, big pieces of it just cancel, just as they did over here. In fact, the same rate cancellation takes place over here. Remember that the L by the V sub i is P sub i. Here's P sub i. Here's P sub i. Things in the red squares cancel again. They're gone. The other two terms can't cancel each other. One involves Delta P, the other involves delta Q. Those are independent variations. They can't cancel each other. But what we can write down now is that the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to P sub i, that's a small change in H when you change P sub i a little bit, Q 
keeping q sub i fixed, the h by dp sub i, keeping the q's fixed, is just what? What do you read off this? v sub i and the h by the q sub i, what's that? It's this. It's minus dl by dq sub i. Now so far, okay, that's not bad. Some nice equations, but they get a little bit nicer. Huh? L by the L by the V sub i, right? Well, no, sorry, the L by the Q sub i, right? That's it. You remember the Lagrange's equations? The L by the Q sub i, what's that? Okay, let's write down Lagrange's equations over here. D by dt. Oh. The L by the Q sub i <coughs> dot is equal to the L by the Q sub i. That's Lagrange's equations. What's the L by the Q dot? <coughs> P. So this is the left hand side is P dot i is equal to the L by the Q sub i. That's all it says, that the time derivative of the canonical momentum is the L by dq. Well, let's look at what we have here. We have the L by dq, right? That's just equal to minus p dot. That's Lagrange's equations. p dot is the L by dq. So we have one equation. Let's get rid of the middleman here. We don't need him. The h by dq is minus the time derivative of p. Well, what is vi? Q dot. I'm going to go through this again. I'm going to do it again. Well, oh, these, of course, are Hamilton's equations. They're quite beautiful. H is a function of p's and q's. That's the way you think about it. The Hamiltonian is a function of p's and q's, momenta and coordinates. You get rid of the velocities. Replace them by p's. And then the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to p's defines the q dots. And the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to q's is minus the p dots. That's the structure of mechanics in the Hamiltonian nutshell, if you like. Let's go through it again, just uh, since it was a, a series of steps, all of which are abstract, none of which are entirely intuitive. Let's go through it again. Here we have H is equal to summation p sub i, v sub i, minus L. L being a function of q and v. Now let's make a little variation. That's going to be equal p sub i delta v sub i, plus v sub i delta p sub i, minus the change in the Lagrangian. What's that? Oh, sorry, excuse me, thank you. Minus V sub i delta P sub i. But now we have to calculate the change in L. The change in L is minus the derivative of L with respect to whatever it depends on. But it depends on Q's, delta Q's, and it depends on V. Everybody gets an I. And there should be a summation sign, which I'm too lazy to write. OK, now, first of all, what cancels? The things multiplying delta V cancel. 
Why? Here you have p sub i. And here, sorry, did I say that right? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. The L by dv sub i, that's p sub i. Definition of p sub i. The L by dv sub i. That's how we define canonical momentum. Gone, gone. And then we look at left over, what's left over, and we see that the derivative of h with respect to p sub i is v sub i, but v sub i is q dot. And then we look at the other one that says the derivative of h with respect to q sub i is equal to minus the L by the q sub i, minus, but then we use Lagrange's equations. The L by the q sub i is d by dt of p sub i, that's Lagrange's equation, or just minus p dot. So we see that mechanics, in great generality, gets repackaged as a system of first order equations of very great simplicity. You need to know one function of p's and q's. Knowing that function of p's and q's immediately by differentiation tells you how the point moves through phase space. It tells you the velocity through phase space. Q dot, of course, is just the ordinary velocity, but the combination Q dot and P dot, let's put the sign on the other side over here. The combination Q dot and P dot is a kind of velocity through the phase space. It tells you, if you know P and Q, you plug it in the H, calculate the H dp, the H dq. If you know P and Q, then you immediately know P dot and Q dot. So it reduces mechanics to a system of first order equations for p's and q's. Every p has a partner called q, every q has a partner called p. They come, come in pairs. And the Hamilton equations are one, no, sorry, two for each i. A pair of equations for each i. Let's do it, just for simplicity, for, uh, for f equals ma. Let's just check that it really is correct for f equals ma. <coughs> As I said, I have no idea what motivated uh, Hamilton to write these things down. Mm -hmm. But they certainly do have a very, very simple structure. And one of the things they show you is that surprisingly, with very, very different physical interpretation, P's and Q's seem to be very, very different things. Q's are, are coordinates, P's are velocities, are connected to velocities. And yet, there's this enormous symmetry between P's and Q's. They seem to come into the equations in an extremely parallel and symmetric way. Apart from a single minus sign over here. They seem to enter in, uh, in a symmetric way into mechanics. And it's the study of these equations which really uh, defines modern mechanics, if you like, modern uh, classical mechanics. <clears throat> Let's draw a picture to indicate what's going on. Here's general phase space, P and Q. It's not just one variable, there's many variables. Some subset are called P's, half of them are called P's, half of them are called Q's. I can't draw them all on the blackboard, so I'll draw just one P and one Q. At every point, Where's my equations? Here they are. At every point, I could calculate the h by dp and the h by dq 
can tell you exactly what q dot and p dot are. That defines a kind of velocity vector through the, uh, through the phase space. Not an ordinary velocity, but a phase space velocity. Let's draw that phase space velocity as an arrow. It's showing which way that point is moving in the phase space. And the length of the arrow we can take to represent how fast you're moving through the phase space. And so what the Hamiltonian gives you is a, a kind of flow through the phase space where the arrows are long, you're moving fast, where the arrows are small, you move slowly. And the velocity, as I said, is related to derivatives. Notice one funny thing, that the q velocity is a p derivative and the p velocity is minus a q derivative. Okay? So it's not that q dot is the derivative of h with respect to q and p dot is the derivative of h with respect to p. They get crossed here. They get crossed in the equations. That has a profound implication, as we'll see in a moment. Any questions about Hamilton's equations up to now? Any, any second order system? Any second order system can always be, just by defining the first derivatives to be new variables, then that simply defines a set of twice as many uh, first order equations. That's trivial. But uh, this elegant structure here is far more than that. It has some properties that we'll see in a moment. Yeah. Um, are there any systems where P and B are not one-to-one -one relationships? Um, when it happens, they're usually badly defined systems for which the, um, the evolution is not well defined and usually rejected as being the uh, I mean, are there any systems in nature which require? Are no. There, you know, things hmm? with, uh, circular systems with uh, with uh, friction, doesn't that be slowly? Well, first of all, friction is outside the boundaries <coughs> of, uh, of, uh, of Lagrangian and Hamiltonian mechanics. Okay. Now, not really because uh, all systems in nature are of this type, and friction is a part of nature, but as I've emphasized over and over again, you don't really see friction in a system unless you ignore a large, large number of coordinates. Uh, friction is the, simply the excitation and the moving around of microscopic coordinates that you don't keep track of. So, uh, yeah, the, let me see, I'm trying to think. Are there any systems that I can think of where you can't invert the relation between coordinates and momenta? Yeah, I can think of one. Uh, no, I can't think of any. No, no, I'm sorry. I don't think of any. no, I can't think of any uh, offhand that make physical sense. We'll talk about why, and we'll talk about the importance of this one-to-one -one soon enough. Well, how about the falling at terminal velocity? What? Fall? No, that's friction. That's friction. What's happening is uh, is is right. You cannot write equations with friction in this form. Friction outside the boundaries of this uh, formulation. In the sense that if you wrote the equations that you normally write down for friction, they won't be of this form. If you write the equations governing all of the molecules, every single one of them, and keep track of them all, then there's simply a huge number of equations which do have this form. So introducing friction is a way of approximating a very, very large number of equations of this form uh, by a very small number of equations and ignoring the motion of most of the degrees of freedom. Energy is leaking off into other degrees of freedom. Okay. So friction, we don't want to deal with now. No. Friction is exceedingly complicated. If we define h as that lower left-hand corner, Yes. And then take delta H. Yes. And we apply uh, the, the, equate, the, uh, equate, the Euler Lagrange equations. Then we get Hamilton's equation. That's right? correct. Okay. 
Now, but that's, but where is this Legendre thing coming in here? I mean, what I, I mean, Well, here, we, we did dl by dv is p, and the h by the, here, this is the Legendre transformation. What is the, is it the equation? Is it the, is ah. the right hand side? Is it the, <laughs> It's taking, a it's taking a function of v, where, what is it? It's a procedure. It's a procedure of changing variables, if you like. Changing variables from a set called v to a set called p. Is there any way you can describe that in words? I mean, I can sort of follow the, the arithmetic here, the algebra. No, the genre transformation is the whole bunch of arithmetic that goes into it. Well, you can go from x to u or, you know, like that. If you like, to me, this is the clearest uh, definition of what you're doing. You have a pair of variables, v and p. They're connected to each other. If they're connected in a one-to-one -one way, then you can define. You can define an L of v and an h of p. L of v is the integral under this curve out to some v. h of p is the integral over this curve up to p. The derivative of L with respect to V is P, and the derivative of H with respect to P is V. P times V is L plus H. That's the simple geometry of it. Why is it so useful? Um, you get used to it, and you, uh, you do it over and over again, and you begin to see why it's useful. But uh, let, I would suggest we just go with it, and we will find out just how useful my, uh, uh, Hamilton's equations are. Yeah. So you require that function to be single value, right? Which one? What happens? Yeah. What happens if it's not single value? Then you have a bad system. Then you have a system which uh, physics uh, well it usually means the equations of motion break down at some point. Uh, uh, some breakdown in the predictivity of the equations, some singularity happens. Sure, can you, can you um, identify a typical situation that would represent that? Oh, no. Oh, okay. We could, we could write down some Lagrangians and Hamiltonians which are bad and try to see why they're bad. I think that's a, that's a good thing to do. I'm not going to do it tonight. Some, somebody send me an email. Just send me an email saying, write down some bad systems. And we'll write down some examples where things don't work out well and try to follow them and see where the motion breaks down. See what happens to the motion, how it tells you all of a sudden you don't know which way to go. Uh, it usually means at some point the equation of motion simply is singular. There's some infinity in it and uh, something breaks down that doesn't tell you where to go. Something in the equation becomes infinite as a general rule. Well, presumably it means that your physics is wrong at some point. I think it, usually, it always point, means your physics like, is wrong. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know at least one example <coughs> where it means uh, something uh, can uh, travel uh, with infinite velocity. All kinds of things can go wrong. But I think it's a good idea to take an example or two which, where you cannot invert the relationship between velocity and momentum and see exactly what goes wrong. And I will do that for you. <coughs> but, uh, if you send me an email message, we can do it. I have a strange question. Um, why is it OK to have an infinite number of degrees of freedom in quantum mechanics when we're frightened of many degrees of freedom in friction? Um, no, it's not. Well, first of all, we can have an infinite number of degrees of freedom in the classical mechanics. And infinite doesn't have to do with the difference between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. A field has an infinite number of degrees of freedom. Right. Are we frightened of it? Uh, it can get pretty frightening. Uh, having a field can lead to friction, for example. A electron 
accelerating radiates. It radiates photons. The radiation of those photons uh, tend to act like a kind of friction. And it can get very, very complicated to follow the motion of an electron, including radiation reaction and so forth. Um, why are we afraid? We're not afraid of the many degrees of freedom. We just have to remember that they're there. I think you're asking me why it's so terribly difficult to, to derive the laws of friction from the laws of mechanics. Well, that is hard. But it's also hard to derive the laws of radiation reaction. Uh, it is hard to derive the laws of friction. But uh, that's, that's not for tonight in any case. For tonight, we want to discuss energy conservation, among other things. We already discussed energy conservation several times. But it's interesting to see how these equations, from, our, from the present perspective, these now become the equations of mechanics. This is a new formulation of mechanics based on H of P and Q. Given an H of P and Q, we now have a phase space. You have a motion through the phase space. You can imagine dots in the phase space, a fluid of points in the phase space, moving each point with a velocity that depends on its position according to these equations. And so it's a flow of the fluid. And it's simply a new way of formulating mechanics. Let's forget about all the old ways. Oh, I said I would work that out for you for, uh, for the ordinary particle. Let's do that first. Ordinary particle, again, 1 half mg squared minus u of x. That's the Lagrangian. 1 half m, m x dot squared. Now I've replaced q by x. Uh, we've done this before, haven't we? Yeah. What is it that I want to do? I just want to check these equations. Okay. So what is a Hamiltonian? We've done that before. Everybody remember that it's p squared over 2m plus u of x? p squared over 2m plus, plus u of x is the Hamiltonian. Let's just check Hamilton's equations. The h by dp Differentiate that, that's P over N. That's what it is. Is P over N equal to Q dot? Or in other words, is it equal to X dot? Yes, it is. And X dot is equal to P. So the first of Hamilton's equations, the H by DP is equal to Q dot. That's nothing but the definition of momentum in terms of velocity. And what about the other equation? The h by dx minus the h by dx should equal p dot. The h by dx, that's just du by dx, minus du by dx, that's equal to p dot. Well, that's just Newton's equations. Mass times acceleration is equal to force. So the second equation. Typically, the way it works is the first equation is um, the relationship between position, between, sorry, velocity and momentum. Okay. It's just P over M equals X dot in the simple case here. It's the second equation which really looks more like F equals MA. This is mass times acceleration, and this is force. Okay, so it does work. It is correct. It is true. And it is equivalent to all the other uh, formulations. We could work out some more complicated examples, and maybe we will. But first, let's concentrate on, in this new form, let's concentrate on energy conservation. Let's see if we can prove directly that energy is conserved. Let's calculate the HDT. Time derivative of the Hamiltonian. If the Hamiltonian is energy, which it is, then it should be conserved. Its time derivative should be zero. Let's calculate it. It's equal to the derivative of H 
with respect to p times p dot plus the derivative of h with respect to q times q dot. Sum over i. The change in h when you change p times p dot plus the change in h when you change q times q dot. That's the change in the Hamiltonian per unit time. But now let's use Hamilton's equations for p dot and q dot. What is p dot? p dot, this is equal to the sum i, the h by dp sub i, that's this. But what is p sub i dot? Can somebody read it to me? It's just a sign that I don't remember. Minus. That's minus. So minus the h by dq, right? And how about this one? This is plus the h by dq. h by dq. The h by dp sub i. And they cancel. That's what the minus sign is doing there. Is that equation if and only if? So if we have the conservation of energy, we get balance equations? I think it's possible to imagine equations which have a conservation of energy which are not of the Hamilton form. Uh, if you have Hamilton's equations I've, with a time-independent Hamiltonian, I've assumed the time. I've assumed there's no explicit dependence on the Hamiltonian of time. Uh, then you do get energy conservation. The other way, no. I think you can, no, you can certainly have equations which have conservation laws, conservation of an energy, without them being of Hamilton's form. So it's not if and only if. Uh, all right, so we see that these two terms simply cancel each other. And energy conservation is a very, very simple consequence of Hamilton's equations. Um, it's kind of interesting. What this says is that if you take a point and you follow it, now from now on I want you to think about the phase space as a collection of points that you can follow in time. As you follow them in time, you stay on a contour of constant energy. Imagine the space space, and imagine it being filled with contours of energy. In other words, surfaces on which the energy is constant. It's simply filled up with surfaces on which the energy is constant. The phase point, meaning a point in this the phase space, as you follow it, stays on the same surface of constant energy. That's just energy conservation. And the fluid flows, the fluid defined by the phase space dust, think of a dust in phase space, flows along these lines, which are lines of constant energy. The lines of constant energy, in general, could be closed. They don't have to look like this. They could be closed curves. For example, we studied a case last time called the harmonic oscillator in which h was proportional to p squared plus x squared. <coughs> well, let's, let's, let's forget the constants. It was just forgetting the constants. It was essentially p squared plus x squared. So in that case, the contours of constant energy were just circles around the origin. The contours can be open or off to infinity, they can be closed curves, they can even be a dot. That corresponds to a motion which doesn't go anywhere, so it just sits there. For example, the harmonic oscillator which has neither position, which is at the origin with no velocity. It simply sits there, it doesn't move. That's a kind of degenerate circle uh, right at the origin. So the phase point moves on these surfaces. This is very much like the discrete situation where you have different closed uh, p 
pieces of the phase space, and that defines a conservation law, which one of the cycles you're on, we we'll call those cycles. Well, in phase space, it's very similar. Every point is on some contour of constant energy, and you move along those contours. Yeah? The density of points is constant, right? We're going we're to talk about that, yeah. The density of points is constant. How do you get these diverging lines? Oh, well, that's, that's easy, actually. We haven't discussed the fact yet that the density, the density of points is constant. Um, but let's, let me answer your question. Okay, so let's... Let's imagine lines that look like this. So the fluid comes in and goes through a narrow channel. What happens when fluid goes through a narrow channel? It moves faster. It moves faster just so that the density doesn't change. A big lump of fluid comes in, and it doesn't want to change its volume, so it has to squeeze between these lines faster. The lesson is where the, where the lines clump up and get close, where the contours get close, the fluid is moving fast. That's, in fact, what, Maxwell's, uh, what uh, Hamilton's equations say. When the contours are close together, think about a contour map. What does it mean on a contour map that the contours are very close? It's steep. Right? It means the altitude is changing very fast. What does it mean on the contours of constant energy that the contours are very close together? It means that H is changing rapidly with respect to either P or Q or some combination of P and Q. So where the lines clump up is where the H by dP and the H by dQ is large, and it's where the fluid is moving fast. So the lines can diverge all right. It's just that the places where they diverge like that, the fluid slows down. And we're going we're to study that uh, behavior a little bit. Closed curves and open ones in the same. What's that? And you have closed curves together with open ones. Absolutely. Let me give you an example. The pendulum. And the pendulum. Small oscillations at the bottom are closed curves. The system just goes back and forth, back and forth, just cycles over the same uh, uh, and, uh, defined closed curves. So <coughs> the, when it swings over the top like this, they sort of correspond to open curves. Well, let me, let me give you, let, let's sit there. To get, to get the pendulum, take a particle that's moving on a washboard potential like that, a potential which is just a sine wave. <laughs> If you start down near the bottom here, and you give the particle a little bit of energy, all it does is oscillate back and forth. So it looks like the harmonic oscillator. In fact, it is a harmonic oscillator plus a little bit of uh, uh, extra. All right, so it just oscillates back and forth, and the contours are closed curves. So for small energy, the contours are closed curves. Give it a big energy, and it just goes whistling off over the top of the washboard. If it has enough energy to climb over the top, and keep going, then the curves are open. The system doesn't come back to itself. It just keeps going off forever and ever. So yes, you can certainly have uh, both closed and open cur curves in the same phase space. It'd be interesting to try to, I'm not going to do it, but it'll be interesting to try to plot what the contours of constant energy look like here uh, on, the, on the phase space. Any other questions? Is there anything you want me to go back over? Yes. In general, the general last coordinate is PI always a uh, 
also multiple of QI prime. Say it again. QI dot. Wait. Say it again extremely clearly. In general, in generalized coordinates. In generalized coordinates. Yeah. Is PI always a constant multiple of QI dot? Nope. Definitely not. Uh, it can. No, 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 not at all. No, it's just. We can invent all sorts of Hamiltonians. Here's a, here's a Hamiltonian. H is equal, instead of P squared plus Q squared, let's take P cubed plus uh, X cubed instead of P squared plus X squared. I, this doesn't correspond to any uh, system that I know about in nature, but there's nothing wrong with it from the point of view of the Hamiltonian. Now, what are the equations? The equations are that the derivative of h with respect to p is equal to x dot, and that's 3p squared is equal to x dot. Well, that does not say that the relation between p and x dot is that p is a constant multiple of x dot. So the answer is no, not in general. Other, uh, this is sort of unusual, but you could have an x here. That would be less unusual. No, sorry, x times p squared. Also, x times p is, uh, is, uh, occurs in Hamiltonians, but x times p squared. <coughs> then you have the h by dp is, um, is x times p, and you would have p and x, the relationship between them having an extra factor of x. So no, no. Uh, there's no reason uh, for such a simple relationship. Yeah? It sounds like we're describing sort of a perpetual motion of, of sorts. Um, really? Would that be an accurate statement? No. Uh, well, yeah. Motion, well, yeah, is, motion perpetual. is perpetual. Yeah. Motion is perpetual. That's why energy is conserved. Uh, but I'm not sure what you're getting at. Um, well, no, it's, um, the idea that with, when you factor in friction that you're actually transferring the energy into another part of the... Yeah, okay. Um, before we can address the real meaning of perpetual motion and the pros and cons of it and so forth, we have to understand something about thermodynamics and we have to understand the difference between usable and non-usable energy and entropy and all that sort of stuff. So we're now at a more basic level uh, studying the individual degrees of freedom of a system, microscope, for example, if it's this table with all the molecules moving around in it and so forth, or the air in the room, these are the equations that really do govern the entire system. Uh, in various kinds of approximations, you divide energy into usable energy or available energy and unavailable energy. Heat is unavailable energy, but that's got to do with the second law of thermodynamics, which we haven't got to yet. I, I would hope to get to it. It would be nice to be able to get to it. It's deeply connected with these equations, and it's deeply connected with the structure of motion and phase space, but we're not there yet. Uh, before we understand that thermodynamics, we have to understand chaos, and uh, we are not ready to do that tonight. Hopefully we'll get to it. Maybe. Okay, so let's discuss other conservation laws. Energy is a conservation law that follows just from Hamilton's equations here. There are other conservation laws, but let's look at the general form of them. conservation laws have to do with symmetries. I'm going to suppress that now. Later on, we'll come back to it and discuss symmetries from the Hamiltonian point of view. But now let's not worry about why there might be a conservation law. Just let's see what it means to have a conservation law. What the necessary and sufficient conditions for a conservation law. Let's ask whether quantity, whether the quantity A is conserved or not. What is A? A is a function of the phase space. 
Wherever you are in the phase space, A has some value. It's a function of the P's and the Q's, or equivalently a function of position and velocity. Let me give you an example. We worked out a number of times ago that the angular momentum of a particle moving in a plane is given by x times py minus y times px. It's a function of the p's and the q's. In general, all quantities that we might be interested in are functions of positions and momenta. If we know the position and momentum of something, we know everything about it. So in particular, we know the value of its various quantities. Let's ask whether A of P and Q might be conserved. Might it be conserved? And under what conditions would it be conserved? What mathematical conditions? Now I want to express those conditions in terms of Hamilton's equations. That's going to introduce for us a new set of quantities called Poisson brackets, fish brackets for those who don't speak French. <laughs> OK, this is easy. All we want to know is whether the time derivative of A is 0 or not. In fact, let's just calculate the time derivative of A. dA by dt. Let's just do it. Brute force will calculate it. It's the derivative of A with respect to p sub i times p sub i dot plus the derivative of a with respect to q sub i times q sub i dot. I'm going to write the summation sign explicitly now for a little while. Summation over i. But now let's substitute in for p sub i dot and q sub i dot their value in terms of the Hamiltonian. So this is sum on i, derivative of a with respect to p sub i. What's p sub i dot? Again, the sign. I can never remember the sign. <coughs> it's minus, right? Minus dh by dq sub i. So we have the a by the p sub i, the h by the q sub i. Now what's this one? This is plus the a by the q sub i and q dot. That's the h dp, right? Well, look at that. That's kind of interesting. We find out that the time derivative of any quantity is given by the sum of two terms. Let me start with this one. The a by the q, the h by the p. So if you know what a is, and you also know what the Hamiltonian is, you can compute these things. The a by the q, the h by the p, minus the a by the p, the h by the q. A very symmetric looking construction, a very symmetric looking expression, mathematical expression, that tells you what the time derivative of A is. This mathematical construction, let's generalize it now. Take any two functions of P and Q, A of P and Q and B of P and Q. Any two. Then you define something called the Poisson bracket. That's the symbol for the Poisson bracket. You take A and B, put them inside a bracket, and put a comma between them, and that's the, that's the symbol for the Poisson bracket. Its definition, its definition is sum over i of all the coordinates, the A by the Q sub i. <coughs> B by the P sub i minus the A by the P sub i, the B by the Q sub i. You can see the symmetry of it. It's 
composed of two terms, one in which A gets differentiated with Q, one in which B gets differentiated with P, and vice versa. That's called the Poisson bracket of A and B. We will see that another formulation of, of classical mechanics is to write everything in terms of these Poisson brackets. But here we are. Let's rewrite. This tells us that any quantity, the time derivative of any quantity, any quantity at all, whether it's conserved or not, in fact, what I'm talking about now is not conservation, but the time derivative of any quantity, and that's equal to the Poisson bracket of A with the Hamiltonian. The Poisson bracket of any quantity with the Hamiltonian is its time derivative. That's another formulation of mechanics, closely related to Hamilton's. But if you're interested in whatever it happens to be, if you can express it in terms of positions and momenta, then its time <coughs> derivative is given by the Poisson bracket <coughs> with the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is a special object which generates velocities, it generates time <coughs> dependence, by taking Poisson brackets. So as I said, this is another, yet another formulation of quantum mechanics, sorry, classical mechanics, where the motion of any quantity is expressed in terms of Poisson bracket with respect to the Hamiltonian. Let's just check it. Let's do one or two examples. If you like, this is a generalization of Hamilton's equations. It includes Hamilton's equations. For example, let's check Q dot. Q dot must be the Poisson bracket of Q with H, according to those equations. Let's see what that says. That says one variable now, one P and one Q. That says the Q by the Q the h by dt minus the q by dp, the h by dq. I've now just substituted for a just good old q. q dot is the Poisson bracket of q with h. The Poisson bracket of q with h is the q to q. What's that? One. All right. So this is just one. What's the q by dp? Zero. Q and P are independent variables. This goes away. And this just says that Q dot is the H by dP. No, that's Hamilton's equation. What about P dot? P dot is the Poisson bracket of P with H. That's the P by dQ, the H by dP minus the P by the P, the H by the Q. What's the P by the Q? Zero. Zero. And the P by the P? I think I just erased the minus sign. One. So that's the other of Hamilton's equations. So the two Hamilton equations are special cases of a much more general rule that the time derivative of anything is the Poisson bracket of the anything with the Hamiltonian. This gives a new view of Hamiltonians as generating time dependence by the action of Poisson brackets. The action of taking the Poisson bracket for the Hamiltonian tells you how systems change with time. That's uh, yet another representation of classical mechanics. I think that's probably, let's, uh, let's stop the questions and not to go, go any further at this point. Is it carbon tax a conservation law? What's that? Is it carbon tax a conservation law? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, since I started talking about conservation laws, now we see that it's a necessary and sufficient condition to have a conservation law that the quantity in question have zero Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian. 
Now, that may seem like an incredibly abstract view of things, and it is, but it's also a very powerful and very general formulation. If you want to know whether something's conserved, you Poisson bracket it with the Hamiltonian, and if it's zero, then it's conserved. If it's not zero, then whatever it is gives you the time derivative. So um, try it out for angular momentum, for example. Try to take just the <coughs> part and see that the angular momentum is conserved by taking its Poisson bracket with p squared over 2m and so forth. Let's, uh, let's uh, just take some questions now and uh, stop for the evening because I think we've probably done enough for tonight. This is very abstract, but it is very powerful. Powerful means that, it, that uh, apart from the fact that you can use it to calculate, which you can, more important, actually, we haven't discussed the fact yet that the density, the density of points is constant. Not only the structure of classical mechanics, but quantum mechanics uh, reoccurs and reoccurs and reoccurs all over the place. Yeah? What's that? <laughs> How did Poisson come up with that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really don't know. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he came up with it exactly this way. By calculating small changes in things. Uh, my guess is he came up with it exactly this way. Yeah. When did you find the bracket? When did you find the bracket? We're using the chain rule there. Well, we just found this structure recurring in many contexts. I mean, you know, that's when, uh, uh, now we're going to study more general Poisson brackets, not just with the Hamiltonian, but between eight pairs of things. Uh, but, you know, mathematicians, good mathematicians, and theoretical physicists, are the people who tend to see patterns. They see the same thing a couple of times, and they say, ah, a pattern. I see a pattern. And uh, he saw the same pattern occurring in a couple of places, and he said, ah, I'm going to call it a key bracket. What are some other examples where B is not each? We just did another repeat. You mentioned the end of the lecture that this is a large body, so it's energy lost. Yeah. I don't think we have Oh, what are you you're talking about the non-conservation of energy? Right. Yeah, good. Okay. All right. I have assumed that both the Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian do not explicitly depend on time. Now, if I explicitly depend on time, it means that there's some time dependence above and beyond the fact that the Q's and the P's or the Q's and the Q dots depend on time. Let's go and ask what happens if the Hamiltonian really does depend on time. How can that happen? Well, you're said, dumping in energy, right? Yeah. But well, let's suppose there's a big lump of matter over here. Our system is over here. We're not going to include this as part of the mathematics of our system but it exerts forces on the end. And it's moving. <clears throat> it moves from here to here in a certain way. That will mean the forces on this system will depend on time. In fact, there will be a term in the energy. Let's just take a single particle. There will be a term in the energy of this particle, u of its position, which also depends on the position of this big lump. But the position of the big lump depends on time. So that means the potential energy depends on x and also explicitly time. It means it depends on time even if the particle doesn't move. It certainly depends on time just because x may depend on time. But that's an implicit dependence on time. There's also an explicit dependence on time corresponding to the fact that the, uh, that the source of the um, of the force <coughs> happens to be moving. All right. If the Hamiltonian depends explicitly on time, let's go back. Where uh, let's 
calculate the prime derivative of the energy itself. <laughs> This was our equation that we had a few minutes ago, and these two things canceled because p dot and q dot are also derivatives of h. But there's just another term. If h also depends on t, then we have to write that the prime derivative of h is the h by dp times p dot plus the h by dq times q dot plus the explicit derivative of h with respect to t. In other words, the change in the Hamiltonian even if p and q are standing still, if p dot and q dot are equal, uh, are equal to zero. That's what happens if the potential energy, for example, depends explicitly on time. Then this would, of course, be just du by dt. That's what it would be. All right, so in that case, even though these two terms completely cancel each other by virtue of Hamilton's equations, there's another term left over, just the explicit derivative of h with respect to t. And that's, in general, not zero. It won't be zero if the Hamiltonian, <laughs> it says what it says. If the Hamiltonian explicitly depends on time, then that will appear in the equation for the time derivative of the total energy. So that's, that's as simple as that. We can, uh, we, can, we, we can do some examples. It's getting a little bit late. I don't want to do an example now, but let's come back to it. An example of a... Uh, of time-dependent Hamilton. Uh, no, just a little definition in the Poisson bracket. Which, which, which is there a convention in terms of which order there is? Because there's a minus between the two. I hope my convention is the same as Poisson's. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not sure it is. Let's see, I always define it this way. A comma B is the A by the Q, the B by the P minus the A by the P, the B by the Q. And you know, I don't think I've ever looked that up to see. But, but right. well, my question was, since you said it's general, general, not just Qs and Ps being, you know, these variables, is it A or Q comma P or A or P comma Q? Is it just a mathematical definition? A just words, is P or Q. Q, which is the first variable, which is the first variable, which is the second? He said this is just a, an abstract definition. You see what I'm saying? I don't think that means anything. Um, you can write it either way. I mean, uh, this is we one, make a this convention. One Let's minus, make a convention. Isn't one minus the other? Mm -hmm. Could it be the A, B, P, the B, the Q? We could define it by dA by dP, dB by dQ minus the other one, but this is the way it's defined. <laughs> it's not my, that's not my question. Is, and since you said you have a function A of P and Q, okay, does that mean that Q is the second variable? Or you say A of Q is the same as A of Q is, are you taking the derivative of A with respect to the first variable right. or to the second variable in your in your in your capital letter? Which one is first and which one is second? <laughs> you two? No, 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 no. There's no first and second. There's P's and Q's. That's all. Normally, normally you put Q position first before momentum. But remember, they're different. You just want to end up with. One, one, first, one variation of the, of the Poisson bracket Tell me. and then minus of the other. Right. If, I write, one of the convention. if I write that the Hamiltonian is p squared over 2m plus um, 1 over x plus g m m over x. Will you please tell me which is the first one and which is the second one? <laughs> it's just two variables. No, but it will reverse the sign. You'll get a reversal of the sign. No, 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 no,
is the first variable. I, you know, I don't want to differentiate something in the denominator. Please uh, don't force me. To I, I, no, I understand what I understand what you mean. I understand what you mean. Momentum and position. That there's only one way of saying so it. That's not my question. No. You said as an abstract mathematics. You said you said that this Poisson bracket's going to come up in all kinds of places. Yeah. So maybe that's not momentum in position, in which case it right. doesn't matter which is which variable. And I was wondering if there was a definition that's all, a, a, a convention. As to the sign of the <coughs> This particular structure doesn't come up anywhere as I know of, except in, that, in, in mechanics. But, um, but some people seem to be under the impression that it's important to describe whether x is the first variable or the second variable. It's not. It's just the x variable. And p is the p variable. Uh, when I calculate the h by dp, I don't have to ask whether p comes first and x second, and so forth. Now, you could have defined the Poisson bracket in the opposite way. In fact, you could have defined the Hamiltonian with the opposite sign. All kinds of things we could have done differently. We made some conventions. This is one of the conventions. Um, I don't know what else to say about it. Let's, let me answer your question. Okay, so let's. You're not satisfied. <laughs> The only question I had was, is the pure mathematical one where you didn't know what P was, you didn't know what Q was, it wasn't momentum, it wasn't position, okay? In which case, there is a difference of a minus sign. And, you saw. and the reason I, the only reason I asked that is you said Poisson brackets come up all over the place, and I didn't know that it was always in the nature of position and momentum. Or yeah, I, I don't know any other place where Poisson brackets come up, uh, except for positions and momentum. I, uh, what I did say comes up all, all over the place is Legendre transformations. Legendre transformations do have this habit of coming up all over the place. The equations for Legendre transformations don't have a funny minus sign in them. They read the L by the V is equal to P, the H by the P is equal to V. So in that particular case, uh, there is no... The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.